welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another Native Paranormal Crossroads. We are introducing the Paranormal Rangers. Lady Michelle, welcome to your show. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. It's nice to be on my own show. Jonathan, welcome to your show, as well as Stan. How are you guys doing today? Doing Hello, good. Emma. Just so everybody, and I'm joined once again by Dale Tobin and Laura, the Queen Massey here. And we have Hello, a puppy here who will be interfering often <laughs> and licking <laughs> toes in between. <laughs> she is our other co-host. Tonight, we are going to be talking petroglyphs. So what exactly are petroglyphs and what can we give people as a definition for them? Okay, I'll I'll start since I'm I'm kind of the resident expert on it. Um, petroglyphs and pictographs are two things that you'll see in ancient uh, uh, carvings into rocks or stone surfaces. Um, a pictograph is painted on with mineral paints. Uh, they still don't know the formula of a lot of those paints that were used, but they've lasted hundreds of years. And uh, uh, scientists are still trying to work it out because we put a Coke can out in the sun for six months, it'll be gone. The, the All the paint will be disappeared. Um, and then petroglyphs are things that are carved into the rock using uh, different tools. And uh, I should state right up front that these things should not be considered rock art, as a lot of people call them. They are not art for art's sake. They are communication. And um, so that, that gets into a whole nother subject. But it is a form of communication. It tells you uh, what's going on in the area, who passed through, uh, where the hunting is, uh, what kind of game can be had and what time of year. Uh, it tells you where the water sources are and even gives you maps of the area. Uh, so, that, uh, so these are petroglyphs. Uh, petroglyphs, I have literally taken the same type of rock and tried to carve things in using modern tools. And I tell you what, it is extremely difficult to, uh, to carve those things in. And yet you'll see massive panels. Uh, I know of one area where you can go in and see so many panels, it would take you three days to actually access all of them and look at them. So part of the th the difficulty of carving in stone is the hardness of stone. This is not just sandstone and limestone. A lot of that's on granite rock, isn't it? Uh, yes, it's all different kinds of stone. And what you'll notice is that they're very uh, directional in their orientation. They're usually faced uh, to an area where the sun is coming up or uh, usually toward the uh, southeast. Uh, facing slopes. And uh, there are some areas where you'll see a beautiful area of rock that has absolutely nothing on it, yet there's uh, this black desert varnish all over it. It's a perfect place. And yet you'll see some little rock off to the side that has a bunch of panels on it. And uh, there, there's, uh, you just wonder why the place was as it was. Do some of them line up with the equinoxes and the solstices too, like in other parts of the world? Uh, they do. They are lined up with uh, celestial objects. And, uh, you know, it's, it's we don't even, un we're, we're just beginning to understand. Um, there's like Chaco Canyon, <laughs> some of Chaco Canyon is the structures are based on the belt of Orion. 
as are the pyramids and other ancient structures all around the world. So uh, there was, there had to be some knowledge being passed back and forth. I lost connection, so I apologize. So I got back on. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> so they have connection to various star patterns. And then oftentimes they relate to the local tribes or the local groups of people that go in and out of an area. Not unlike a newspaper, but more like a, a standing way of being aware of what's in the neighborhood. Um, in our last show, you talked about how some of them could identify strange phenomena, such as Bigfoot being in the area. Yes, uh, Bigfoot has a long history with Native American tribes as they do with indigenous, indigenous people all over the world. Uh, they recognize them. They coexist with them. Uh, you're taught as a child, don't look at it in the eyes, just leave it alone. Um, you don't try to injure it. Uh, just you're living, let it live, and leave it alone. And uh, when when I was with the Navajo Nation Rangers, we actually had a uh, unwritten no shoot policy that uh, we didn't want our officers to be taking pot shots at things, uh, mainly because we didn't want them to be shooting something and say, "I got a Bigfoot." and find a man laying down there with a zipper on the back of his suit. So we thought that uh, uh, maybe being circumspect in that area uh, might yield dividends down the line, and maybe somebody wouldn't get shot doing that uh, prank. I definitely vote that we no one dress up in a gorilla or monkey <laughs> suit and run around in the woods during <laughs> hunting season. Yeah, we just tend to look a little dumb doing that, but uh, that's yeah. us. But there's so, people that do it, so. They will do it. But it's, uh, no one's been shot yet, as far as we know, in a gorilla suit. <laughs> now, the, what's interesting about the petroglyphs, too, it actually goes back to the first contact with Native Americans. Um we won't even say 1492 because I think it was a lot earlier than that. We have evidence that China was uh, here on the West Coast. We have evidence of Vikings on the East Coast. Uh, we just, and we have trade routes all over uh, Central and South America. So um, I'm thinking that contact was a lot earlier. <coughs> and these writings, are a form of communication, they're a form of writing. Now, in the back in the day, there was a universal way for natives to communicate with each other. And that way was sign language. So you could travel all across uh, the country back then, and you could still communicate in sign language because it was a universal language. Uh, we don't have a lot of that today. A lot of it is missing. But when uh, when the Europeans came over in 1492, they said that the natives didn't have a written language. So they called them savages. The true definition of the word savage means someone who doesn't have a written language. Uh, they didn't understand that we had <clears throat> what they call an oral tradition, which had to be exact. Um, and it was memorized and it couldn't be deviated from. So uh, we did have a form of, of uh, recording of our history. And some of that was through petroglyphs and pictographs. So in your time as uh, on the Rangers, uh, you had an archaeological background. How many petroglyphs would you say there are in the in, in the in the Southwest Territories where you're at? Just on Navajo, <clears throat> we have three hundred thousand archaeological sites recorded. Uh, there exists the possible 
possibility of 1.5 to 2.5 million archaeological sites that we don't know about yet. Um, some areas, there are site densities uh, up to 18 to 24 sites within a square mile. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, these include Cliff Dweller sites, Anasazi sites, Basket Maker, uh, Ancient Pueblo, and, uh, you know, it, it just, there's just so much. Why would there be so many in one area? Well, if, if you think about it, <clears throat> when we have people wanting to build a house, they have to get an archaeological survey um, where they come out and they, they do a surface ground survey of the land to make sure that nothing's there. Then they're allowed to build. We have had people in the past that don't go through this process. <clears throat> they build their house or their hogan, and then they would call us and say, right on my doorstep, there's a, a body that a skeletal remains that washed up. And can you dig it up and remove it? And we tell them, no, you, you had to move your house because you didn't get the proper permits. Uh, that's, that's their grave. You leave it alone. For Navajos, it's abhorrent to uh, live on top or near uh, human remains. So uh, it's, a, it's a very big taboo. So we have situations like that that used to pop up. Uh, we'd have not only ancient remains being exposed because of erosion, we would have historical remains uh, back from the 1800s uh, coming out of the ground. And we have modern remains also uh, coming out of the ground, uh, you know, from back in the 60s. So there's, there's a lot of stuff, you know, part of our job was uh, human uh, reburial. And we'd have to make a determination um, if that, uh, those remains were modern or if they were ancient. What were some of the oldest remains recorded, what they found, like, for years? Was there any particularly ones which are really, really old, which the archaeologists found? Well, the basket maker culture <clears throat> and probably the Fremont culture goes back more than a thousand years. And, uh, you know, we don't know the extent. Um, to give you an idea, um, modern science tells us that man has only been around for what, 15, 20,000 years, and that's about it. But that number is being pushed out with new discoveries all the time up in Canada where they're finding uh, remains and, and occupation uh, remains uh, that even go further back. Uh, the Navajos themselves have, and the Hopis have stories uh, in their background of meteor crater. And the stories go something to the, uh, to the idea that uh, there were gods in the sky that decided there are three gods that wanted to commit suicide. They didn't want to live and be alive forever anymore. So they flung themselves at the earth on a thunderbolt and impacted where modern day uh, uh, meteor crater is between Flagstaff and Winslow on I-40. Now, um, what's interesting is the Hopis have a similar story that says that they had a settlement down in that area that was destroyed when that when the earthquake happened from that meteor. And ever since then, they didn't build any more settlements down that way. Um, that settlement very well could have been Hamalavi, uh, which is just on the north side of Winslow. Uh, but they never built down that far again. So both, you know, the Navajos say that this happened at night. That's what the story says. And uh, for them to have that kind of detail tells me that there had to have been eyewitnesses uh, that passed the story down uh, in, in the oral tradition. 
and it became part of the fabric of Navajo culture. Now, that impact happened 50,000 years ago, according to science. So again, that would push out the date for human occupation of these lands to much, much earlier. What's what's the general accepted date for the hope well the hope the Hopi and the hope well for time time uh, act of time? The Hopi have been there since boy uh, since before recorded history. Um, the oldest village in the world, continuously inhabited village, is uh, uh, Oribe. And, um, and then they, they have Kaikotsmavi, which is nearby, but uh, it's actually considered New Oribe, uh, where the government uh, resides. So they have been around, you know, it, back in the 1600s, the 1500s. As near as we can tell, uh, when recorded history started with the Spanish, uh, the Spanish also encountered Navajos at that time. Um, and the Spanish actually referred to the Navajos as the razor people because uh, their, their arrow tips were obsidian and uh, they were so sharp, they were, they were sharper than a razor blade. So, you know, they were very, very much feared uh, to, to engage them in a, in a battle. So, yeah, they, uh, I would say they've probably been here a long, long time since, since the emergence of both cultures. Okay. With that said, let's bring up some pictures of the different petroglyphs. And we'll go through them and help decipher what a petroglyph is. What what it's speaking? Just turn my camera off. Uh, Andrew, I took these in uh, the Uinta Basin uh, near a place called Nine Mile Canyon. Nine Mile Canyon is a, it's approximately a hundred miles of petroglyph uh, Fremont artwork, and you can go through that canyon, and it is chuck full of the history of the Fremont's daily lives. Okay. Um, this is considered a deity of their religious and social communities. And uh, Fremont's had really interesting interaction with a Sumerian written form. Now, I was introduced to this Sumerian written form. I was not able to get my picture. But apparently, the language goes back to 600 BC. And... This was considered one of the ancient language of the Algerian uh, Libyan language. And yeah. they, today they deciphered it. And uh, the, the deciphering of it is you can read, it's called Reformed Egyptian. There was a gentleman from uh, BYU and professors of ancient languages call it Libyan language. And so today it's known uh, as Reformed Egyptian. The Pima Indians uh, down in Arizona use this language. And even today they, they use it in their writing and language skills. So petroglyphs were, uh, uh, were used to describe their daily lives, their gods, their communities, so on and so forth. And so it is reformed Egyptian. And I had the opportunity to be a witness to seeing this. This is on tribal lands uh, of this language. And I wish I had a photo of it. It is it, an amazing. And when I went to get it deciphered, um, this particular uh, line um, had wrapped around. And the two last words, uh, at first they couldn't uh, decipher the word. And so basically, uh, what was interpreted was five warriors were wounded, died and buried here in a straight line. So that's basically what that said. I wish that in, I wish I had that in a photographic thing. So uh, we are older. Uh, Jonathan referred to that, but we are an older civilization than most people think. We go back anywhere, ten thousand to fifteen thousand years ago, and our language. Was, was 
goes way, way back. And we were influenced by other cultures to develop our language. It's beautiful. As, as, you're looking at, as you're looking at this, it feels like you're connecting to the ancestors and those who drew it. It's absolutely beautiful feeling that. And what's it like for you, Michelle, actually seeing that with your eyes and connecting to that frequency of the ancestors? Well, it was interesting to be there at Nine Mile. I know that Jonathan's been there and Stan have been there. When you start to see these actualizations of civilizations on uh, near reservations, you're, you're looking at their migration patterns of where they've been. And they were leaving a history of things. Maybe it was a remembrance of where they camp. You know, maybe it was a, some kind of a celestial map, a navigational map as well. So that came to my mind is these, they were telling each other or other tribes that this is where we've been. And then we travel on. As you know, the Fremont Indian just one day suddenly disappeared. And no one knows where they went to this day. There's, there's, there's talk about, you know, they scattered, but their, their, their remnants were never. Well, the, Fremont, the Fremont, the Hopi, and the Anasazi pretty much disappeared at the same time, right? Right, right. And there's just speculations out there, you know, um, drought could have been an issue, food, farming, things couldn't, you know, they, they migrated onwards, but where, but where? Yeah, the thing is, their culture didn't reappear anywhere else. No, they just suddenly disappeared. Um, in in the Anasazi aspect, we uh, are the Pueblo Indians. We we as Native Americans depict that that they they are the modern day Pueblo Indians, and that they that they kind of integrated into tribes. And who's to know what the cataclysmic event that happened or their migration patterns after the fact. They okay. just disappeared. So let's go to this next image here. What's going on in this image? Oh, that's an interesting one for interpretation. <laughs> I'll let Jonathan handle this one. <laughs> and or Stan. <laughs> You're muted, John. Has muted my mic. There you go, you're we'll, good. We'll blame the host. Anyway, um, as I was saying, these, uh, let's see. Okay, this is actually a man. He's got five fingers on each hand. Uh, you can see the two eyes. He's got a headdress on of some type. So he he's uh, a leader of some type. Mm -hmm. Um, usually you'll see very unusual types. I mean, you could look at this and say, Hey, there's only one eye in the middle, you know, it looks like one of these, uh, bug eyed monsters, but, uh, but I think he's, uh, without context, uh, this is a, a figure of a man and you have to understand that. Again, this is not artwork. This isn't science fiction, fancy, uh, carved into the rock by somebody. This is something that was seen. And um, sometimes you have stories of uh, native tribes traveling through different, uh, what we call dimensions now, but back then they would have considered it a different world. Uh, you have the Navajo uh, talking about coming through a succession of different worlds uh, that were inhabited by different creatures and different insect peoples and different giants and everything else until they reach this world. You have Hopis that uh, came out from underground from an emergence location um, in the in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and. So you have a lot of stories. Other native tribes have similar stories uh, all across the United States of, of an emergence. Um, we reinterpreted that migration symbol as uh, a dimensional portal because we started seeing that uh, 
that our story tells actually of coming in two different worlds through a hole in the sky. And um, so a lot of tribes have these stories. Uh, the Hopis today um, have, you know, 250 to 350 different Kachinas representing uh, beings that they've contacted um, during their uh, their yeah, ceremonies like or wanderings or whatever. Can you, explain, and, can you explain what a Kachina is? A Kachina, just so everybody knows, mm -hmm. and you can look it up on the internet, are these dolls that uh, used to be just very plain uh, painted uh, <clears throat> sticks made out of um, a cottonwood root that's very lightweight and easy to carve. And they were given to children to show them what these uh, individual gods would look like uh, or, you know, holy beings is what they're referred to. The, uh, this art form has actually gotten to the point now where these things are, uh, uh, the human figure is correct. They look like the actual dancer. Some of them can command thousands and thousands of dollars um, to purchase now. Uh, so if you're going to start collecting kachinas, um, be careful, number one. Uh, I've actually had Hopi people tell me that the kachinas on their mantle place would sometimes switch places in the middle of the night. And then you have... Um, you have so many of them and at about, you know, figure about 500 to a thousand dollars a piece. Uh, you're looking at a lot of money to collect, you know, you know how we are when we collect, we got to have them all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> would, each, would each tribe have its own, own types of holy being different ho holy beings than the Navajo or was there a general sort of holy being? Oh, yeah, the, the Navajos have the Yebiche, which are considered holy beings that came to the Navajo to impart knowledge. Uh, you'll see these uh, pictures of uh, a, somebody with a mask over their head. It's black, and it has two little white eyes. And they, they're usually shown on TV as skinwalkers. Mm -hmm. uh, so in our presentations, we often put a picture of the Pope up and say that according to uh, the same reasoning, this is Satan. Uh, depending on what denomination you come from, uh, that could be true. But, um, you know, it's, it's taking an image that looks otherworldly and suborning it to what, you know, just because it looks strange. Uh, the the Yebiche are actually uh, beings that, that are here to help us. And like I said before, the last Yebiche in the line of usually 10 or 12 is considered the clown. He's the one that's mm -hmm. goofing up, making all the mistakes. And he actually represents the five-fingered people. That's you and me who cannot take instruction uh, the holy beings tell us not to war with each other, and we're the ones that go out and war with each other. So we do the seemingly the exact opposite of what we're being taught to to stay away from. You know, I really find it interesting as you're you're saying this, Jonathan. I'm remembering that the, why the oral history is so important. As we talk about language, um, you know, I wish I had a photo. Next time we get on, I will find that photo. Uh, how language, <clears throat> every tribe has its own language, has its own emergent stories. It has its own deity stories. In this picture, uh, the five fingers were, were in relation to an important person in the community that was regarded in Chaco Canyon in their in in their depiction of, of petroglyphs, a six person, a six, they have six fingered people. And that was also considered somebody of importance within the community who we don't, you know, I mean, you know, we just know we have this artwork out there and um, there are ceremonial 
you know, uh, occasions where it's being taught to the younger generation through sacred ceremonies of what the depiction of these gods to us are. Uh, but we don't have it all. We don't have all everything. We don't have everything, the structure, because everybody has their own emergence and creation stories. So that's what's so fascinating about being Native American across the board is every tribe had their own depiction of their deities and gods. Yeah, we we have actually seen a uh, panel depicting a man four fingers on one hand, six fingers on the other hand, and the same with the toes, four fingers or four toes and six toes. He has a distended stomach and he has distended uh, genitalia hanging down. Um, what was interesting about that, talk about historical context, um, that panel is right next to 98 open uranium tailings pits where uranium was being mined. And I can't help but wonder if the uh, ancient peoples of that area actually uh, built some of their structures out of this uranium log material and were being irradiated and we're seeing birth defects. Uh, this picture was put up indicating that there was somebody with a defect, but in those days, someone with six, six fingers and four fingers would be considered uh, maybe blessed by the gods because you do see depictions of uh, holy people that have three fingers and four fingers or even six fingers. And about what year did the horse come around? I would imagine during the uh, the conquistador when the conquistadors came across from Spain. About sixteen hundreds. Hundreds, yeah. Could it have been even earlier, fourteen hundreds, when Columbus came to the West Indies. Yeah, when he got lost and made that wrong left turn. Yeah. <laughs> Saddled up the horse wrong. So, yeah, so me and Stan have been to so many of these sites. Um, a lot of the pictures that I have, um, I wasn't able to get them into this presentation because they're on slides. I used to do, this is before PowerPoint. Um, mm -hmm. Back in the 90s, we had slide, Rolodex of slides to go through. And so all my pictures of ruins and stuff like that are, are on, uh, on slides, and I don't have any way to transfer them at this time. Um, but, you know, we've run into just literally thousands of these sites um, in remote places where possibly very few people have ever been to and seen. Uh, and, you know, talk about adventures. Some of them are so dangerous to get to. Uh, Stan can tell you stories about having to rescue people that were in a group uh, that were looking at things because they, they got trapped on a cliff. Um, so it gets uh, it's kind of dicey when you're trying to get to some of these locations. Some of them you actually have to rappel into. And why would they be built in such unique places like that, like having to rappel into? Uh, in this in this case, we're talking about the cliff dwellers. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was a natural yeah. defense. Okay. You now you have to make a differentiation. Navajos talk about Anasazi. They talk about uh, the. Um, uh, what was that? The, the the tribe up there in your area, Michelle? Ute Nation. Pai no, the, Shoshone. No, the, the early one. The on uh, oh um, Shoshone. No. The Fremont. The Fremonts. Yeah. So uh, had a brain fart there. 
But uh, the Fremont, the Anasazi, they were also knew the basket maker and what they called cliff dwellers mm -hmm. and the Hopi or the Pueblo people. The Pueblo people are not just the Hopi. They're all over, uh, you mm -hmm. know, all the way over toward Texas. And um, the reason that they differentiate between Anasazi and cliff dwellers, uh, cliff dwellers were considered uh, the ones that built Mesa Verde. The Anasazi in Navajo culture were slavers. And they picked up slaves from different areas and, and basically held them in slavery at Chaco Canyon. If you look at the construction of Chaco Canyon, look at the walls, if you ever go there, you will see different masonry styles. Now, imagine if you captured people from different tribes in the area and they had different methods of building and you told them, okay, I want this wall built or this section built, but each group had a different method of building. And so you'll see some of this evidence. Um, eventually, the uh, Anasazi, um, they said that the gods caused a huge sandstorm and drought to take place that basically drove them out. And uh, they've disappeared uh, from the scene, never to be seen again. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the story. Now, the cliff dwellers many of them were incorporated into clans of the Navajo. Uh, so you have Kiaani, uh, the Towering House clan that was incorporated uh, as a clan of the Navajo. You also have Mojave Indians mm -hmm. that were picked up. Uh, and there's two clans that are related to the Mojave. There are other clans that are related to the, uh, to the um, to the Mexicans that were incorporated in, so so Navajo had a way of of uh, investing people and saying, "Hey, you're you're welcome here. This is your clan." I wish we could do something like that today. It's we really can the digital clan. <laughs> digital clan yeah it's really interesting as he talks about ancient civilizations and the emergence of um the slave trade there was a lot of uh raiding going on amongst the native americans in early early days and practices and so i think there was really interestingly enough is how did ancient re reformed egyptian get into the uinta basin and did they did the Egyptians interact with these tribes in those areas? Of course, uh, and I'm not talking about the U Indians. I'm talking about older civilizations, Shoshone, Fremont. You know, was there a language um, there was. over going over? Yeah, and, yeah. and the Cree you know, Indians, the Cree Indians of Canada, speak a, a very different form of Hebrew, actually. Yeah. There are many, many Cree stories uh, being contacted by the different Hebrew priests after they heard them talking. And in the late 80s, uh, a group of he of Cree Indians, I forgot the name of the chief that went there. I, I interviewed him on Wolf Spirit Radio some years ago. Um, but they brought there and they were speaking an older form of Hebrew that was word for word exact. Like Hebrew is meant to be kept exact. The Torah is meant to kept exact. So it was a different ver different dialect. The original Cree language links to Hebrew. Many, many of the cultures' language have a common root language um, to the Middle East, the Middle East Sumerian con uh, cuneiform connections. Exactly. And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, a lot of the Utes will say, no, I, we're, 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 we're related to the Aztecans when, in fact, it's now been determined that they're connected to the Chinese. 
And uh, so there's this this integration going on in, in ancient civilization with other cultures from across the oceans. Uh, you know, we don't want to get into the Pangea of, of these uh of this landmass, but, or even get into the ice age, you know, these people were traveling over and now they're, they're finding archeologically speaking, a group from France came over here um, in those times and influenced a lot of the um, Canadian Native Americans, First Nations. So there's this, and now archeological evidence is coming forth now that they're finding these ties to other cultures of of ancient civilization, you know, in the European in area, so it's it's a really interesting to understand migration patterns, and then how we get some of our our emergence and our stories that come through that. We just don't have exact written history to tell us just these. Uh, leftover uh, petroglyphs that just tell about daily life, what's going on, who's important, who's not important. We have no names. We have no, you know, other types of art, you know. What was the practice of the art form back then, you know? All right, so let's move on to the next petroglyph. Okay. Uh, what do we got going on here? Well, what I was told is this was um a connection to the uh uh the cosmos as you can see the vortex over here um jonathan i have a different version but this is what i was told this was a connection we have spiritual connections to the uh, cosmos um and and these things were going on in the solar system this was a part of the uh, our connections. As you can see, there's someone held the knowledge right there, that, that interesting man down there. So you, you don't you don't think this is uh, I dream a genie in the bottle? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you if you look at that spiral swirl on the right, um it's really evocative of a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, it, it amazes me that they would, back then, in the 600s, 800s, they would know about galaxies. How did they know? You know, you, you can't see a galaxy with your naked eye. Mm -hmm. You can see the Milky Way, but we're right in the middle of it. We're on the Western spiral arm. So, you know, it doesn't give you that perspective of what one looks like. So there's there's a lot going on uh, that I see. That's uh, Again, it just makes you question. Uh, and we don't have a lot of information, like I said. And interestingly, what I've found with archaeology is that archaeologists will get ready to do a dig. They'll write up their paper and they'll say, we expect to find the following. So they've already made up their minds what mm -hmm. they're expecting to see and what they're expecting to find. If they find anything else, it it's tossed aside. Right. Which goes against scientific exploration, the very new the nature of the observer. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, Joe, let's go to the next image. Jonathan, those are warriors. Yes, they are. And they are in the typical Fremont style. Mm hmm. Uh, which is a trapezoidal figure. Um, you have the the mountain sheep on the upper left, and um, you'll you'll see depictions of them all over the place. I'd like to find out what kind of jewelry he was wearing. 
<laughs> you too could have a Fremont earrings, huh? Yeah, exactly. exactly. What's the in in the middle um, on the left hand side that like infinity symbol or like an egg timer on its side? The figure of eight. The bow tie looking thing. Yes. Well, I believe that that is something that's hanging on his arm. Mm. Uh, there's more to that symbol because uh, we saw that in an earlier picture. And yes. um, so it extends further, almost like, like a jagged mm -hmm. lightning bolt going out of there. Okay. Um, Laura, I would imagine there were people in the community of the Fremonts that had distinctive roles they played. Mm -hmm. And you know, the artisan of this particular petroglyph was showing of the importance of that scene. Maybe it's something, a celebration, who knows? I'm just, see, that's the thing about petroglyphs. You can conjecture anything you want, what you want to see. Okay. What's in the bottom right? It's kind of faded out. It looks like a half moon connected to a stick. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I see that. In the on the bottom right to that right, there's another. Looks like the same thing. Half two half moons meeting each other. Could it be a, a solstice calendar? It could be some kind of calendar, or it could be um, an actual stylistic representation of corn. Okay. Uh, yes. So are these guys defending their corn rights from the sheep? <laughs> or protecting them. Or maybe they're protecting their fields. Yeah, when the time comes, I'm going to go talk to those ancient ones. One thing that I see in this is that often you'll have varying size of different characters or beings. Mm-hmm. And whether that's actually showing a three-dimensional rendering of an event that's occurring or if the size of the beings is in relation to the importance of that individual, maybe a shaman or a medicine person or uh, maybe a, uh, a leader of a group of people or something of that nature. Uh, but they're very there's a lot of detail in within within these panels um you'll see at times not only different types of animals depicted but different varying beings that are present um you'll have different tools and weaponry and things of that nature like john said earlier headdresses uh, you may even have some type of armor or clothing or shields or something of that nature, too. So they're very detailed. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting, Stan, you know, being up in the Uinta Basin and being going to the Dinosaur National Park. It was interesting because we, we, we did a depiction with one of the Ute leaders there. Um, it was really interesting what he said about this particular petroglyph. Um, I wish I had that photo too. Um, he was saying basically is um, in their lore, they showed a depiction of the little people, the Sasquatch on this wall, it was pointed out and it was very distinct. And then he said there was a gathering of nations which shows a lot of people that depicted that too, that they, sometime they gathered together all nations of that, of that area and whatever they were gathering for, maybe it was celebration, maybe it was harvest, who knows? Uh, maybe it was treaty time, who knows? And ceremonial time that they all came together in peace. So he depicted that being, that's what it was in their lore and, and, and their, and their culture and their tribe according to the oil history that they gotten similar to what we do as Navajos and our other ancestor forms of tribal affiliations. 
what are your thoughts on how these were placed on the rock? You know, how they were done? What are some of your thoughts on that? How they were drew onto the rocks and the artwork? Well, John and I, a lot of times we, we've discussed that a lot of these ancient peoples were actually, their technologies were in advance of what we are today. And we look in general in science today, we, they look back on those times and say, these people were very primitive and, uh, you know, but I, John and I don't really, we don't follow along those lines. We think that those people's a lot of times were much more advanced than we are today and uh, uh, had technologies in some cases that far surpasses science today. So, Yeah, archaeologists would say we, we diminished to uh, a, a stone type of tool with kind of a chisel type made out of stone. That's where it got diminished. And then, you know, and with the rangers, I, I really feel that we had technologies um, maybe as people would say on the mystical side right. um, and we might be missing those abilities for them to maybe they were the sacredness of, of what they were trying to depict for that to, to last 10,000 years is an amazing technology and um, like the pyramids of, of Egypt's one thing they were saying you know, how could they get those lines really straight? And apparently there was a, a guy in uh, South America who found a, a certain plant that had a certain glue. And the Egyptians, he said, uh, concocted a, a formula where they could put a plaster on the pyramids and preserve and the outside. And they, they lasted this long. So it was a certain type of plant glue. And, you know, that's kind of an interesting concept, similar to cement to, to our day. Well, I think yeah. there's, it's commonly understood that, that um, yeah. what people refer to as extraterrestrial today, uh, mm -hmm. beings from other solar systems and that are, being reported and witnessed uh, forms of like uh, UFOs and or what they refer to as e, uh, UAPs, the things that are being seen today. Um, so you talked about people like the Zuni uh, and Clifford Mahuti, who's now no longer with us. He used to talk about how the Kachinas really, in his view, represented these star people or these people from other galaxies, other star systems. And in the technologies we're seeing with these UFOs, these things can be <laughs> probably millions of years in advance of the technologies we have to this day and if they were in direct contact with the ancients the people of the, that time you talk about basket maker and fremont and if they were in direct contact with these beings then they may have been uh, open to those technologies that the extraterrestrials may have had and may have may have gifted them with certain technologies and stuff. So um, you talked about the the pyramids and, you know, there's things that modern man can not even to this day with all his technology can't duplicate. So um, it's very interesting. Yeah, Steven. the the um, just just to be straight up with this, the hope you tribe has stories of its people using baskets and gourds to fly in. Uh, in ancient India, there were tales of ships that could fly in the sky. Yeah. 
um, and even of atomic weapons. And they've been doing excavations over there. Even in the Holy Land, they found an area with one ruin on top of the next, on top of the next. And then they ran into a layer of fused green glass. The last, the, other, the only other time we found a layer of fused green glass was at the atomic test site uh, during World War II when the first nuclear bomb was set off. The, the sand on the top surface turned to green glass. So um, I think really that we've been on this planet for a long, long time. We may have destroyed ourselves several times. Um, I think other Indian tribes have stories of, of uh, flying, of their people being able to access dimensional gates, uh, you know, of, of even interstellar flight. So, you know, we just don't know. We, uh, we don't look at that stuff. We just, we like to say, oh, everybody was a caveman. You know, going ug ug ug, and and beating a woman over the head and dragging her off by her hair, and uh, you know we that's our version. Yet ten thousand years ago, the Chinese were studying medicine, and a lot of their stuff is being used today. Um, we're just starting to get to the point. Uh, I can remember when uh, if you wanted to see an acupuncturist back in the nineties. Uh, they looked at you like you were going to go see a witch doctor. And now it's it's pretty much, you know, even the hospitals have acupuncturists. So, um, you know, chiropractors the same way. You know, you, you were poo-pooed if, if you wanted to see a chiropractor. And, and you see jokes about that today. Oh, they're not real doctors, you know. So we, we look at it from a monetary standpoint doctor makes a lot of money so he's got to be good right and nobody else makes that much money so they don't they don't get uh, the a lot of doc a lot of, a lot of doctors graduated with a c plus average okay right. <laughs> a lot That's of doctors true. the vast majority of them are c plus average okay <laughs> let's move no. on to the next metric lift let's do it To me, it looks something like some kind of insectoid type of being. It's a representation. I would think there's probably a lot more to that panel, but yeah. you can see that it's it's basically from getting wet and freezing, it's spalled off, and yeah, a lot of it is missing. The other thing, too, is... A lot of these sites have been vandalized and uh, over the years, people have shot these things with firearms and, and or hit it with rocks and damaged or destroyed things. They've even re removed some of the actual panels at times, uh, which is, um, it's too bad that people are have that level of ignorance to damage these things. Yeah, and even well-meaning people have used chalk to outline, you know, to mark inside the, the lines on these to make them stand out more. Mm -hmm. But that chalk actually goes into that rock and can destroy it from the inside out. They've also taken sheets and uh, taken paint with rollers and rolled over the top so they can get an impression and take that sheet home, but the paint gets left on the rock too, which can also damage it. So there's very few ways to actually record it other than going in with a 3D camera and then rendering it afterwards. Which is yeah, my recommendation is a, yeah, my recommendation is a 3D camera or a camera on a tripod that you can get accurate pictures. The right filters. Well, I was very fortunate that I could get these photos because these are on native reservation lands and they do not let anybody just go. You have to go and get a guide with you to, 
to find them. Okay. Uh, I was Let's move on to the next one. Okay. Those are more warriors getting ready for a war. I wish you could enhance that and yeah, they're they're very stylized, but uh -huh. there's definitely a group of them. And if you look closely, the the two leader figures are actually uh, almost look like they have helmets on with antenna. Uh -huh. uh, there's insectoid types down, all over on the left. Right. So when the warriors and the insectoids show up, what does that signify? Usually, sig usually signifies that there's some kind of uh, alliance there. That they're okay. working together. So they're not just having a barbecue. <laughs> no. Maybe later. <laughs> the interpretation I was told it was they were going to war. Because there was a lot of history going to war with the conquistadors and the natives uh, fought the conquistadors and won. Because some of this art is, is time. They still use the interpretations as such as you're going to see in these next slides where how far into the future they go. So the tribe allows different timelines of Okay. I believe we only got a couple more picks. Let's go to the next one. We got sheep. Livestock. Yeah, and there's more there, but it's it's worn out. I mean, you can't even can't even make it out anymore. So you put the sheep up there and the dog starts barking. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. There we go. Got so a good, good um, horse here. This is really interesting. Um, I, when I took this photo, I was told that back in the uh, times of the uh, infrastructuring of the West, the homesteading and everything, um, cowboys would come and they would depict their art in the same area. So this is modern day petroglyphs depicting who was in the area at that time, which I thought was really fascinating because it is, deep, cool. you know, yeah, it's a really cool, cool piece of modern art. Yeah, it looks like Roy Rogers. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they were still roaming the, the range. And so this is a good, you know, modern piece of the 19, I do believe it was 1920s when this art was depicted, but I, but they were still doing that yeah. even on the reservation, which I thought was fascinating. Well, any final words that you want to talk about for petroglyphs? Yeah, uh, again, to reinforce that these are not art for art's sake. They are uh, historical renderings of something events that actually took place. Uh, they are not um, an artist going out there like we see today and, and doing a mural on the side of the building. So I do not call them art. I refer to them always as petroglyphs or pictographs, but never refer to them as rock art because it isn't art for art's sake. Um, and these things, you know, unfortunately, we're not growing any new ones. Uh, what we have is a finite uh, supply. And as these get damaged or stolen, then they're gone forever. And we'll, we'll have no idea. Nobody can try to interpret them later on. Right. I would just remind people that 
go out and visit these sites to not be putting your hands on them or affecting them, contacting them with any any instrument or anything like that uh, in order to preserve them. When you when you place your hands on these, you're you're putting the oils from your hands into the rock. And during the regular cycle of the year, you know, it's exposed to hot temperatures, sun and winter and freezing. And, and by doing that, by, by uh, exposing it to, to oils in your hands and other things, uh, it's going to affect it. It's going to damage it. And uh, so uh, feel free to look and, you know, enjoy it, take a picture of it. Uh, maybe, you know, set up your easel and paint a picture of it on the side or whatever, but please protect it. Uh, do what you can to protect it. And especially if you see somebody vandalizing these sites, please speak up and, and um, because we, like John said, we only have a set number of these and we're just now learning a lot from them. So for future generations, protect them. Okay. Well, we are at the end end of the podcast. You guys have are doing a membership drive. Please go to the Paranormal Rangers website. There'll be a QR code code up in the corner over there for all those of you QR code capable. It'll take you right to the website. There's a special offer that's going on for just fifteen dollars a month. You can come and join the Paranormal Rangers beyond their podcast. Have backroom access through the member shows only. That will be once a month. They do member shows. Please give them a little bit of love and go on to the website. Sign up for the email. Also, the email list so you know what's coming on with the Paranormal Rangers. All right, guys. Any last words that you want to say before we go to our next podcast? Happy Valentine's and watch out for the Cupids. <laughs> yes, watch out for the Cupids. All right, guys. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I just thank you to all, everybody that tuned in. Uh, we appreciate it. And keep an, ear out, keep an ear and an eye out open. We've got some special stuff coming up with the Paranormal Rangers. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel for the Paranormal Crossroads podcast. See you later, guys. See you. Bye. Bye.